welcome to OMSI's Virtual Science Pub. My name is Sean Rooney. I'm the educator here at OMSI in the Life Science Lab. And I'll be your host tonight for Science Pub. Before we get started, I have a couple of things I'd like to tell you about what's going on at OMSI these days. Like, OMSI is open again. I'm actually at OMSI right now. I'm in the Life Science Lab in my office. Our current exhibit here at OMSI is Dinosaurs Revealed. It's open through Labor Day. There's animatronic dinosaurs, fossils, replicas of fossils, two dinosaur skeletons. It's really cool. Advanced tickets are highly recommended though. You can, um, while you're here, uh, besides the dinosaurs exhibit, you can also catch a planetarium or catch a theater, take a tour of the submarine. Um, please though, check our website for the most up-to-date information and make sure to review our COVID safety guidelines. I hope you enjoyed tonight's pre-pub trivia and the music by local Portland artist, Rowan and the Billy Goat. And putting on these live shows does take a lot of work and we have an amazing partner that helps us make this happen. A big thank you and shout out to Celestream. Thank you, thank you, thank you for, for providing this live stream services for tonight's Science Pub. We appreciate their support. Also, Join us for our ninth virtual OMSI After Dark. That's right, you heard it, our ninth virtual OMSI After Dark. It's the best of. So celebrate our best beers from the past science pubs, best ciders, seltzers, snacks, all those good things. Um, tickets include uh, 10 items, two cozies, and access to the event. And check out the website for more details. Also, what else is going on at OMSI? We have uh, virtual workshops. You can learn lots of new things like making fresh mozzarella cheese or how about making sauerkraut? I really wanna do that. I, I wanna do both of those things. That those sound pretty good. I, I might actually sign up. Um, you can also make kombucha, it's another class. So check it out also at the OMSI website, omsi.edu slash workshops for more information. Also, since we're doing things virtually, you can still help us put the pub back into science pub experiences by ordering great food and drinks and beverages from some of our partners. Check out the list. Lots of great things to select from all across the state. So no matter where you're joining from, you can help support some of our partners. Okay. Let's talk about tonight's schedule. So if you're familiar with OMSI Science Pub programs, the virtual ones, you, you know the drill. But if you're new to it and you don't know what we do, so first we're gonna start with an Alaska-themed trivia game with a guest. And that'll give you a warm up to what we're gonna be talking about tonight. And then, oh, make sure to grab a pen and paper for this because you can participate at home on the trivia but after the trivia, we have a great lecture by Paul North. And we'll be talking more about that pretty soon. After the lecture, Paul will take your questions. You can submit them at any, any point by um, via the comments in Facebook or YouTube if you're joining from YouTube. Um, we'll collect them and we'll ask them to the speaker towards the end. Also, if you enjoy tonight's lecture, please consider making a donation or purchasing a Science Pub pint class. It really does help us uh, continue programs and bring in experts from around, um, around the globe to, to talk with you. Uh, but don't worry, there's no pressure to donate. Our mission at OMSI is to inspire curiosity by creating an engaging science learning experience of people of all ages and backgrounds. So sit back, relax, get ready to have fun for the event. Trivia, as promised, we have trivia. Um, again, make sure you get pen and paper. You can do this at home. Uh, this week, we have a guest with us. Her name is Jen Powers. Um, Jen is one of our amazing educators that works right now 
in the featured hall with the dinosaurs um, exhibit. Hey, Sean, thanks. Hey, Dan, how are you? I'm doing pretty good. How are you doing? I'm doing great. I'm doing good. great. Good to see you. Yeah, you too. Um, is there anything in particular you're excited to learn about today? I saw like the miniest preview of the slides and there looks to be the most beautiful photography. And I'm just really excited to see one, how you get that in the ocean uh, and to just learn a little bit more about it. I'm so fascinated. I my background's in plant sciences and so marine biology is adjacent, but definitely something I don't know as much about, so. Nice, yeah, yeah. yeah I'm right there with you. I, um... I, I love learning about all kinds of animals, all kinds of creatures, everything. But um, yeah, sometimes things in the ocean are, just feel so far removed. I don't quite know as much about those. So I'm, I'm really curious. Um, are you ready for the trivia game? Yes. Bring it on. All right. All right. Again, <laughs> if you're at home, um, take some guesses too. And um, as, as we go through the trivia game, if you have multiple people at home in the same room, you can make bets with them on who uh, does dishes or who takes out, um, who who has the next week of chores or maybe a massage is in, 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 the, in, the, uh, in the game. So make your own bets. But um, here, Jen, you ready? Yes. Okay, let's start. And we're gonna start with the true or false question. Good 50-50 chance. Question one, yeah, 50-50. We, 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 <laughs> we thought we started kind of like true or false. True or false, Alaska is the most northern, western, and eastern state in the United States of America. True? That feels like a trick question, but I'm going with true. <laughs> yes. Let's find out. It does. No, I agree. It does feel like a trick question. Um you must have went to some of the same schools I went to. Yes. Yeah. So. Okay, let's see where we're at. Um, true. Okay. It's true. <laughs> yeah. Good. So um, it's the easternmost state, which I didn't know this, but because the Alaskan huh. island of Atu or Atu, I'm not sure how to say that, but it's the opposite side of the 180 degree longitudinal line. So it's wow. officially the easternmost area. That well. is a very fun fact that I'm going to use in my future. <laughs> yes. Yes. That's, that's really good. Um, cool. So one out of one. Doing good. <laughs> All right. Are you going to keep track? Yes. <laughs> I am right now. <laughs> hey, question, okay. question two for you. Okay. Our guests at home or wherever they are. The five Eastern Pacific salmon species are king, silver, pink, red, and what? Your choices are A, is it dog, B, chum, C, kita, or D, all of the above? Well, it says there's only five of them, so all of the above sounds silly. Sure. And I don't know what the answer is, so I'm going to choose dogs because I have dogs and I like them a lot. Okay, uh, <laughs> I, I like I like your logic there, um, but, but it's not it's not accurate, is it? <laughs> well, if you go back to the trick question of one, <laughs> this one can be a trick question as well. They're all synonyms for the same fish. Okay, so I was a little bit right. Yeah, you, a you little were, right. You were, you were a third of the way right. You got one of the names, dog. Um, okay. And here's um, here's how I remember it. Um, you can remember it on your hand. I learned this in outdoor school. Actually, I'm the outdoor school. So you ready? I am, yes. <laughs> okay. The five salmon. Um, your biggest finger is the uh -huh. tallest. It kind of oh, is over all of the other one. Your middle, the middle finger, king. That's uh -huh. the king. So that's one. Sure. So sure. All. Um. Your ring finger here, mm -hmm. you know, might have a, a ring on it. So that's silver. Okay. Yeah. Pink. You have your pinky pink. Okay. I like that. <laughs> um, I learned it as chum. So that rhymes with thumb. 
Uh huh. So, yeah, yeah. And the I last one there is red, but um, red is also called sockeye so salmon. So mm. thinking of like poking a finger in the eye, sockeye. Um, <laughs> That's sockeye, amazing. Sockeye. There you go. You can also really fun fact I'm learning tonight. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, okay. One out of two. Let's go to the next one. Okay. Okay. We have a true or false again. True or false. All humpback whales leave Alaska during winter to migrate south to warmer waters and known breeding grounds. True or false? Wow. I would think yes, because I know that whales, at least some species of whales, migrate. So yes, true. True. Final answer, true. Final answer. No. <laughs> yeah, you know. Um, some remain. Yeah. You know, it's always tricky in biology, those words of all, or, you know, yeah. like it always does. You're like, oh, I don't know. But yeah, so some humpback, it's false because some humpback whales remain in Southeast Alaska to feed on its bounty year round. And some of these whales hunt as individuals or some hunt in large groups. And um, yeah, both take a great amount of time and practice to achieve success, just like any good skills. Yeah, I believe that. <laughs> All right, question four. Here we go. A hydrostatic skeleton. So let's, question four is a hydrostatic skeleton is, and here are your choices, is it a when invertebrate surrounds itself with water to protect itself? Mm -hmm. B, bones that become porous from soaking too long in salt water. Okay. C, pressurized inflation that fills an invertebrate structure with salt water or D, a vestigial bone structure that is no longer used in invertebrate anatomy? Hmm. Wow. Um, I want it to be C, because that sounds cool. Yeah, that sounds really cool. Yeah. Um, good, let's Yeah. Let's, let's look. <laughs> Nice. It. Yay. It is cool. Yes. Pressurized inflation yeah. uh, that fills in a verb structure with salt water. And that's what um, they use that to help help move themselves too. Hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Cool. Nice work. All right. Two out of four. Doing good. This is where it, <laughs> this is where it turns around. It all turns around here. Okay, question five. All right, Jen, this question is about the giant Pacific octopus. I love it already. Yes, especially this, <laughs> look at that thing. All right, the giant Pacific octopus earns its name by having a what length wingspan? Is it A, a six foot wingspan? B, 12 foot wingspan? Could it be C, 15 feet? Or D, 25 feet? Well, if I'm going based off this picture where this giant octopus is taking over a pirate ship, I'd choose D. But I think that that's unrealistic. <laughs> and I'm going to choose B. Going with 12 that feet? Seems, that seems more realistic to me. Well, I couldn't quite hear. Was it B or D? I want to make sure. Oh, for real? Is it 25 I, I just, I just wanted to make sure. <laughs> what was I... All right, hey, you're right. It was D, Sean. <laughs> really? That's so D. big. It can take over pirate ships. 25 feet. Yeah, that is enormous. <laughs> enormous. Well, um, I mean, it's a big octopus. I guess a giant is in its name. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's a well one. Okay. All uh, right. I nice totally thing. got that right. Yes. <laughs> Next one, <laughs> true or false, sea stars breathe through their feet. True or false? Obviously <laughs> true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sound very certain about this one. Yes. Okay. Um, sea stars breathe through their feet. True or false? Yes. Ooh. Yeah. That's so cool. I feel like I'd heard that before and then you 
and then you were surprised that I sounded so certain and then I wasn't sure, but I'm glad. <laughs> yes, they, they, breathe, uh, they breathe through their feet through um, papillae, which mm. are um, these tiny structures, also called skin gills, apparently. Oh but it um, provides oxygen exchange. So that's, that's where they breathe through. Sounds a lot like stomata on plants. Oh yeah, cool yeah. connection. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> some say stomata, some say populate. <laughs> um, next one. <laughs> next question. <laughs> Don't laugh. All right. Seven, question seven, nudibranchs. Great word, Love another them. great name. Um, yep. Nudibranchs are in the snail family. Okay yet have evolved to, is it A, consume poisonous creatures and reuse the poison for their own protection? Is it B, um, they have evolved to not need the protection of a shell? Mm -hmm. Is it C, they have evolved to rely on color as a warning system to potential predators? Or is it D, all of the above? Wow. Well, they don't have a shell. At least I think they don't have a shell. Uh, so B is true, but this feels like something that maybe is all of the above. Because those both sound like cool things. Yes. So would it, would it, which, uh, which way are you heading? I don't know. I'm going with B. That's the one I know for sure. B? Yeah. Don't need a protection of a shell but all that crazy poisonous and color system is just way too much. I mean, they're cool, but yeah. <laughs> no. Oh, they're, they're that cool. <laughs> they, are, they are beyond cool. <sighs> um, so close. Yes, have evolved to do all of the things. Interesting. So they consume poisonous creatures and reuse the poison. So those, so they can not need a shell um, and for some reason, they choose to warn others by being really flashy and colorful. They are really colorful. That's true. <laughs> um, neat. Okay, so all of the above. D for nudibranchs. Um, let's move on to question eight. I'm ready. Okay, this is about seawater. And seawater in the world's ocean has an average salinity of A, 15 parts per thousand. B, 25 parts per thousand, C, 35 parts per thousand, or D, 55 parts per thousand. What is the salinity of the world's oceans? It's an average, because uh, I would imagine that some seas have more salt or less salt. Mm, right. 25, B. All right, going with 25. Let's see what you got. Sticking with it. Ah. 35 parts per <gasps> thousand. Um, and the, yeah, crazy. like you said, different seas, like you were saying, have different yeah. amounts. Um, but the average is about 35 parts per thousand. Now I, I know. Measure, measured by weight. Like, mm. so, um, yeah, so 35 parts salt and yeah. A thousand parts of water by weight. Crazy. You can make your own seawater. You do. Mm -hmm. you, now you know the recipe. Now I do know. You're right. <laughs> okay. I'll do that right after I get off of this call. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. uh, question nine, true or false? Mm -hmm. A male killer whale is much larger than the females. This size difference is mostly for breeding and makes the males slower and or hunters compared to the females? True or false? Hmm. Sure, true. Okay. Yeah. Any, any, any reason why? I, I think that the females of a lot of species don't get as much credit for the awesome hunting that they do. So I, I kind of want it to be true. <laughs> okay, okay, let's see. Nice. Yes, it is true. A male killer whale is much larger than the females. Mm -hmm. um, and it could be by um, 
you know, five or more tons heavier. Wow. Um, yeah, they're pretty big animals. Yeah. Um, okay. Ready to move on to our last question. I'm ready. Question number 10. Okay. Okay. Question 10 is sea cucumbers, sea stars, and sea urchins are all echinoderms. Okay. Which comes from the Greek word meaning A, lords <laughs> of the water world, <laughs> B, unpleasant to the touch. <laughs> More languages uh, probably need a word that me means something like that. Yeah. <laughs> Unpleasant to the touch. C, <laughs> the C, hedgehog or spiny skinned. Or D, not okay. fit for eating. <laughs> That's a great one, too. Oh. I'm going with C. You going with C? That sounds awesome. Okay, hedgehog or yeah. spiny skinned. All right, let's see what we got. Yes. Yes. You are correct. <laughs> hedgehog or spiny skinned. That's but awesome. I, yeah, all the other choices are really great too. Um, they I were. <laughs> I guess we can pretend the kind of derm means that. Okay, well, I'm going to pretend all of them are true. <laughs> Sean, I got six out of 10. That's not bad. <laughs> hey, not bad. Not bad. This was tough. There were a lot of trick questions in this one. Um, yeah. I yeah. <laughs> well, but um, Jen, thanks so much for joining us tonight. Of course. Um, I hope you had a good time. Of course. It was lots of fun. I'm excited to see Paul's talk here in a minute. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. Me too. All right. I'll see ya. <laughs> and now, um, I hope you all did well on your trivia too. Um, go ahead and check your scores, talk to your people around you and compare notes and, um, make sure to, you know, check, you know, check their, their, their score and they didn't accidentally or purposely make a D a B at some point. But, um, once you settle that, I have our next guest for you. Our speaker for you is going to come on. And our speaker is Paul North, founder of Meet the Ocean. It's a Portland-based nonprofit that uses storytelling and interactive technology to advocate for Earth's marine ecosystem. Um, Paul produces online media and outreach campaigns to encourage public awareness and also he visits schools and children's hospitals internationally to present content from Antarctica and other far off destinations. So please join me all in welcoming Mr. North. All right, let's take it away, Paul. Hello all, one moment. All right, technology is with us. Uh, thank you, Sean and Jen, for that great Q&A. Lots has been learned. Uh, some tr trick questions were in there on purpose. And welcome everyone to the great Alaskan invertebrate safari. If this is your first invertebrate safari, have no fear. Uh, there will be danger, there will be lessons learned, and there will be more color than you can probably handle because unexpectedly, Alaska is a very colorful place. So buckle up and we're about to learn some things. Before I do that though, I should probably introduce myself. Who am I? Why am I here? Well, there you see me in Antarctica, kneeling attemptedly heroically upon the sea ice. I actually just got done with a dive, so I'm trying not to look cold. And this is what I do. I am essentially a cold water specialist. Now. That doesn't sound like something you can be a specialist in. You just roll into it, right? But really, it becomes more of a challenge of what can you accomplish? What can you find? And what can you discover and then share with audiences just like yourself? In order to share, of course, we need a fair amount of photographic equipment. A lot of what you're seeing in this presentation was taken basically by everything you're seeing on screen. 
in some manner or another. But I have to admit, as nice as the photography is, it's not really how I identify. I find myself more as a storyteller. I have a career in the theater before I got into ocean science and conservation. And as a storyteller, as I continued to dive, I needed a platform in order to tell these stories and to tell the whole story of the ocean better. So I built one. I started a nonprofit in 2017 right here in Portland, Oregon, and we have been going strong. Now, storytelling is a powerful thing, but how do you tell the stories and why and what is your audience? Well, after about 100 episodes of our podcast, I have to say uh, the topics never really end, neither does the interest. We have had experts on our podcast like David Sibley, uh, David Dubelay, other people not named David. And of course, we're talking about the creatures of our planet, those that interact with the water, those that live in it full time. And I'm very happy to share that we were just included in the top five category for podcasts about science and education. And that's by the Webby Awards, also known as the best of the internet. Now, you can see I have some competition, Neil deGrasse Tyson and StarTalk, CNN, and you know, that green owl that wants everyone to be multilingual. So this was, this was something special. This was me waking up and realizing that we are actually doing something that has a lot of meaning and we're getting these stories out to the world. The winner was announced today and it was someone other than Meet the Ocean, but that's okay. Uh, Cause you know, one day we'll get a budget and a place to actually record that's not my closet. But right here in Portland, Oregon, top five podcasts for science and education. And where do we record these podcasts? Well, sometimes it's here in my home, but a lot of other times I'm traveling. And one year I'm in Easter Island. Next thing I know, it's Mexico. Might be Antarctica after that. And in all of these places, I'm asking the experts and the explorers that I interact with why the ocean is important to them. Now, spending so much time down in Antarctica, you get to know the locals. And I have come to realize that people get really excited about penguins. It doesn't matter how old you are or what culture you come from. It's sort of like heat melting ice. It just, it just has an effect on us. And realizing that effect, I wanted to create a program for young people in order to explore Antarctica like never before. So we created something known as the Penguin Pen Pal Program. Now, you remember pen pals. I'm sure some of you do. Yes, you do get a letter from a penguin. There is an Antarctic biodiversity card game that we created. There's stickers, postcards. And there's also virtual reality. Now, I've spent about a year, in my, a year and a half of my life in Antarctica recording down there and taking that footage and bringing it to young people, young people in schools, young people in children's hospitals, and really wherever we are invited, we come with all of this ocean fun, all of this knowledge. And it's because I believe that we need to experience our planet before we can really start understanding just how valuable it is. Now, this virtual reality is obviously very effective. It literally takes you to Antarctica. And if you're interested in the Penguin Pen Pal program, you can find out more about it on our website. Now, we are living uh, hopefully near the tail end of a pandemic. And of course, that shut a lot of things down. It shut down our education tours. It shut down Las Vegas. And all of a sudden, those shuttered doors and all those performers not working became an opportunity for our little nonprofits. And I took that theater degree that I got so many years ago, and I got in touch with some people who lived in Vegas, worked in Vegas, and all of a sudden, unplanned and unbeknownst to me, we turned Las Vegas into the center of Antarctic conservation for a very brief time. Now, if that's not a juxtaposition, I don't know what is, but what you are looking at are unemployed Cirque du Soleil performers who performed for their planet with Meet the Ocean, and we created a 30-minute film known as Winter in Antarctica. You can find that at winterinantarctica.com. I am happy to say uh, that it has been accepted in over a dozen film festivals, 
Like I said, it included Cirque du Soleil performers, also the Nevada Rhythmic Academy. This film has won a best costume, best sound design, and most recently, best short documentary at the Barcelona International Film Festival. Now, if there is no other reason to see this film, except for the penguins, uh, I would say it's for the costumes. Holy mackerel, our producer and costume designer, Ra Ra Pasoy, knocked it out of the park. And in short time, in under one month, from idea to final product, we made a 30 minute film to bring people to Antarctica like never before. So now you're saying, wait a second, I didn't know nonprofits could do all these things. And really you're probably asking is, what is this guy willing to do to get people's attention? To let them wake up for a second and realize what's in their ocean, why it's there and how it interacts with their lives. Well, I will do anything it takes. And if that is creating films and podcasts, I'll keep doing it. If that's comedy or drama, then so be it. Uh, what you're seeing on my chest crawling up onto my face mask here is one of the largest sea stars in all of the oceans. And it does reside in Alaska as well, called the Sunflower Sea Star. And of course, Alaska is where we are going this evening. We are on an invertebrate safari after all. But you have preconceived notions of Alaska. It's not your fault. It's just how our brains work. So you probably think it's beautiful and you are 100% correct. You hear the word Alaska and you probably think bears. Well, I apologize. There are no bears in this presentation, but there's a black bear uh, print that just for those visual learners out there. Of course, Alaska, you think, you think salmon. And we just learned about the five different species that are in Alaska. And you probably think about eagles, maybe some ice, all of these things exist. And we also learned in the trivia that there are humpback whales up in Alaska as well. All of these creatures are wonderful. All of these creatures all have spines. So you're not gonna see them. So enjoy them while you have them as we head underwater soon enough. Now, my name is Paul North, and I did go to Alaska in 2007. Now, many ask, how do you get a job in Alaska if you don't live there? Two things. One, do not tell them that you're from New York. That's a bad idea. Number two, uh, lie and say that you can cook, or at least that's what I did initially. I, I can cook now, but initially, straight out of my graduate degree, uh, I needed a job, so I tell a bit of a white lie, and that has led me onto a career where I haven't looked back. Since 2007, I've been interacting with Alaska in a variety of ways, some of those commercially fishing for salmon, some of those commercially diving, like you see me here uh, with all of my equipment there, and that bag strapped to my chest is for commercial harvest diving for species that we will soon talk about. I would like to say special thanks to my friends up in Alaska at the Sitka Science Center. These are real champions. They create community programs that help educate and inform uh, not only the locals, but the tourists who visit the area as well. Uh, they, have a uh, they have a real live killer whale skeleton, a touch tank, an aquarium. If you are ever in Sitka, give them a uh, look them up because it's really a special place. And now let's go underwater because that's what we're here to do. And when you go underwater as a diver, you're looking for something specific, not complicated. It's just specific. And that is kelp. What is kelp? Kelp is the largest form of marine algae. You might hear it called seaweed, kelp, flotsam and jetsam, who knows? But what we're talking about is this photosynthetic uh, organism that creates habitat and food for nearly all the creatures I'm about to share with you. Now, these aren't like plants on land that stick their roots into the ground and pull nutrients out of that soil. There's none of that available on the bottom. So what kelp does is create something known as a hold fast, a hold fast. It's named that because that's what it does. This is what the base of kelp looks like. These are not roots. It is a structure to hold on to something, normally a rock or something heavy, maybe a shipwreck, who knows? Uh, but as you can see from this snail here, like I said, this is both habitat and a buffet. There's a place to gain some food, 
place to gain some shelter. And shelter is important because when you don't have it, then you have to sort of improvise. Now I know this is a fish. Fish have spines. There are beautiful fish in Alaska and I just couldn't help sharing some of them with you. Uh, this one is a, a cryptic sculpin. Cryptic meaning that it likes to hide. Not only does the coloration on its body do that for it, but by dumping some sand on top of it as well, then it completely disappears and is usually just waiting for its next meal. Other on the fish all-star list is the wolf eel. You might have heard of these or even seen a photo. Maybe not of this one though, because this is a juvenile, super orange when they are young and very gnarly sort of blue and gray when they're older. They can get very long and they like to hide in cracks. Here's a fish that earns its name. You're looking at a sail fin sculpin. Much like that killer whale that we were discussing, the males have quite a large dorsal fin that they can actually lift and uh, drop down much like the mast of a sailboat. This is not functional. It doesn't do a lot of good for them in terms of gaining some food or opportunities such as that, but it does make it look good to a potential mate. And that's how nature works. And that's a lot better set up than this fish, which kind of just has a hole in its head. Uh, this is a rock poacher. Uh, when I saw it, I think my brain broke because I was like, what, what are you? Why are you? How are you? Which is probably similar questions that are gonna be going through your brain as we go through the slides. And last, the last thing that we're gonna see with a spine before our true invertebrate safari begins is what I consider the cutest fish in the world. It's called the grunt sculpin. Feel free to disagree with me, but this thing's about the size of a golf ball uh, and it is adorable. So let our invertebrate safari begin. And we're gonna move through this via some categories. And the first one is one that you are probably familiar with. Crustaceans, right? The crabs and other things such as this, those with the exoskeletons, segmented skeletons, which means that they're part of the arthropods, which take up more than 70% of life on our planet. Think of arthropods as insects, essentially. On land, they crawl, they fly. In the water, they kind of do the same thing, except through a different medium. And let's see some of the variety that Alaska has to offer. Now, I talked about kelp being a home, and that is exactly what this crab is sitting upon. And that's why it earns its name, the kelp crab. If it was seated upon a rock or maybe a Lamborghini when a scientist first found it, who knows what its name would be now, uh, but this is the kelp crab. And do keep in mind that I am shooting things with a macro lens. So as they fill up your screen, we are still dealing with creatures that are quite teeny tiny. Now, you can't go to Alaska without bumping into a shrimp. It's actually hard to take a photo underwater in Alaska and not have a shrimp sort of photo bomb you as you go. They are wonderful, curious creatures, always looking to clean something. Essentially, these guys are, are like the, the garbage men of the ocean. They're opportunistic. They pick off parasites. Some will clean the teeth of other creatures. And there are known cleaning stations. Most of those we see in tropical areas where people are filming them, but they happen in Alaska too. I've sat there, I've put my hand out and waited patiently, sort of look the other way, turn back. Next thing I know, I have five shrimp on my hand and they're all pecking away at the dead organic matter that had landed on my glove. Now, crustacean. Here's one that you might not expect, but it is a cousin of the shrimp. And here you're seeing a discarded exoskeleton of the creature, but that's telling us exoskeleton, definitely a crustacean, but this is the exoskeleton of a barnacle. A barnacle. You've seen them in the intertidal zone. You know, uh, if the water is low, then they'll close up in those little shells. But these are a cousin of the shrimp. Uh, an old school naturalist once described them as a shrimp-like creature who glues their head to the ground and surrounds themselves by a calcareous castle, essentially a shell. 
and then spends the rest of its life kicking food into its mouth. Now this exoskeleton is quite small, maybe an inch or so, but barnacles in Alaska can get massive. What you're seeing at the bottom of your screen are essentially each the size of softball. And those softballs were former shells of barnacles. Now, these still have a purpose. These can make a great home for a fish or another crustacean. Uh, but you can just see that it's very impressive. And anytime you're seeing something that is as large as that, then it tells you about the productivity of the area, that there's a lot of food, a lot of opportunity for these creatures to grow to the size that they are. Now, here's something unexpected, another crab, or is it? Would you just swim over this if you saw it? I did. It took my dive buddy to sort of hit me and point out that it was there. And what you're looking at is an umbrella crab. Very strange, very unique, very like a horseshoe crab on the East Coast in that when you pick it up, there's not a lot going on underneath the shell. Just a couple legs and a little bit of mouth for eating. This creature is not about mass. It looks a lot bigger than its actual body is. That shell is very thin and it's largely decorative so I can slink down like this and just disappear. Now, I do wanna point out something. You're gonna be seeing a lot of colors, specifically red and orange. And as we see that, specifically jumping species to species, we have to ask, why? Why all the orange? Why all the red? Well, it's camouflage. It looks so orange and red because I shined a very bright light on it, actually two of them. If that light didn't exist, then the color orange and red sort of dissipate. They, they disappear as you head underwater. For example, if I had no light on me and you and I were diving and I took a shiny red apple down and you were staring at that apple as we descended through the water, it would suddenly turn brown. And it would do that at about 15 feet. And that's because the light from the sun diffuses in the water and it's not as powerful to pull out all these colors. Thus, if you are a brightly colored creature in the ocean, specifically in darker, colder water, then you are well camouflaged and that increases your ability to survive. So not the same species, but still a crab. Here we have another little orange guy. This one was about the size of a quarter, I'm not joking, just itty itty bitty and you're probably asking what that pink stuff is around it because that's going to pop up in a lot of photos as well and that is just a calcareous algae it literally grows over the rocks encasing them in sort of a calcium carbonate crust think of that as like a hard chalk that it mineralizes as it grows creates great habitat for all these creatures now you are looking at a juvenile puget sound king crab. We're in Alaska, but you know how ranges of creatures work. So we're well outside of the Puget Sound here, but this little quarter-sized creature can live 60 to 100 years. And when it grows up, it turns into something else. And by something else, I mean one of the most lethal things I've ever seen underwater. This one I photographed in March of this year. And actually, I should just note that all of these photos, at least the underwater ones, were taken during COVID. Uh, five weeks of diving, three weeks last October, two weeks this March, and thus I am able to present to you today. This crab was larger than an extra large pizza. Just think about that. And that's its legs and its claws combined. It was bigger than an extra large pizza. And it was holding on to a female crab waiting for her exoskeleton to molt because that's when reproduction can happen. So it was literally pinning the female down to the ground and patiently waiting for nature to literally take its course. Sort of fascinating to come upon. I did have a macro lens on, so I couldn't capture the whole event, but I figured I could get up close to show you just how many appendages these crabs have in front of their mouth. Now, this might look like decoration. It almost looks like a mustache on this guy, but this is not decoration. This is function. And by that, I mean, these many appendages move on their own. They, they create microcurrents. And those microcurrents help to bring food into the crab's mouth. 
especially if the big claws are ripping and tearing things apart, then the microcurrents will bring all of that food into their mouth and they need to eat because they need to grow, especially if they live 60 to 100 years like this guy. So there are our crustaceans, the first stop on our invertebrate safari. Now let's go on to a, another category entirely. And that is the Nidarian. Notice how I didn't pronounce the silent C, just Nidarian. Now think of these like the stingers, because this is one of the traits that unifies these creatures. What do I mean by stingers? If I say the ocean and stingers, there's probably one thing that you think about, and it's this. It's a jelly. It's not a jellyfish. Fish have spines. This is an invertebrate safari. It's just a jelly, and because sometimes humans are uh, bad at naming things, this one's just called a water jelly. Good job to whoever uh, named that one. Obviously very beautiful, mobile, able to move through the water column, but Motion is, is not facetious. It's not moving about just to move. With every pulse of its body, it is extending those tentacles, which are full of stinging cells too small for the human eye to detect. And in doing so, it's essentially dragging this carpet of danger and doom to whatever small fish or plankton might come in contact with it. And that will make it a quick meal. Now, Nadarians stretch much farther than just the jelly. They are, are, they are on the bottom as well as anemones. Think of an anemone as a jelly that sort of lives on the bottom. I mean, they share a lot of characteristics. One just likes to move around, whereas the anemones often will just sit and patiently wait like a landmine waiting to be touched. I really like this image because you can see that these three creatures have spaced themselves out. There's no reason to crowd, and they do have the ability to move. It's very slow. It's a, a game of inches, but they have created enough space because there's enough water current on this Alaskan volcano uh, for them to space out. And you can see by it, its extension of its mouth, that sort of lip puckering that it's doing, that this creature is hungry. Anemones come in all shapes and sizes in Alaska. I really, I, I couldn't show you all the species, so I'm just going to show you a highlight reel and just how they exist. Some of them are the size of basketball and are fish eaters. And I don't mean juvenile fish, I mean any fish that comes into contact with it. Whereas something smaller like this, which is smaller than my fist, will focus more on the planktonic community. But like I said, they do get big. This is a rose anemone. And I only had one strobe light, so it's extra dramatic as it, you know, lights it from a top and creates all those shadows. This creature is splayed out, constantly moving, not only with the water as the current and the surge pushes it back and forth, uh, but also just waving those traps, waiting for something to come in contact with it. Now, if we touch these with our fingers, our skin is too thick. It won't sting them, but don't ever kiss them because the skin on your lips is much thinner than the skin on your fingers and their, their needles can essentially pierce the thinner skin. So be careful. There's a lot of these on the Oregon coast. Uh, very beautiful, very dangerous to creatures of a certain size. Now we're, we're showing them as individuals, but very often anemones can group up and when you see clusters like this, and I'll tell you, I have dove on some walls where there was nothing but anemones for maybe 50 feet, 50 feet across and 100, 100 feet vertically up and down. And then I kept swimming. And then there was this another sub subsection of an entirely different species of creatures. And that's how the ocean works. There's these patches where one creature becomes successful and then starts to dominate. And of course, it's a real estate battle. So they're always nudging each other back and forth and fighting this miniature war. But when you're in these battles day in and day out, and here's the cool thing, we don't actually know how long a lot of these anemones live because they're not expending a lot of energy. So energy tax is one thing that really limits life. If you have to work hard, you know, you're, you're being rougher on your body, but they just sit there and they wait and 
And because of this, they might live 100 years or so. Obviously, it depends on the climate and the species, but all very fascinating. Now, we have seen them extended, hunting, appendages out, but these creatures can also retract. If you remember from the trivia, we discussed hydrostatic skeletons. Hydro meaning water, right? So if an anemone wants to get big, it fills itself up with water. If an anemone wants to reduce its size, or maybe there's some predator that's trying to nibble on it, then it will go inside like this. But that's not only for a defensive measure. If it catches a very large prey item, then all of those stinging tentacles can collapse upon it. And in doing so, it sort of guarantees the meal. So I, I'm quite certain that this one was feeding rather than hiding at the moment. And you're seeing variety. You're seeing different sizes. You're seeing different shapes, different colors. One of my favorite of all time to photograph, specifically with the macro lens to get all that detail, is this. This is a close-up of the stinging tentacles of a giant plumose anemone. You might also hear them called metridiums. And here's a fun fact. They live in both the Atlantic and the Pacific Ocean. And when it comes to invertebrates who do not travel that well or that far, they have to rely a lot on the ocean current to get from A to B. That's very impressive to know that this creature lives in the Atlantic and the Pacific. And it also probably speaks to before we closed up certain waterways, um, you know, things were probably passing through geological activity has created paths between the Atlantic and the Pacific for millions of years. So that was likely the opportunity that these anemones, these Nadarians had. Now, Nadarians even get cooler because we've been talking about individual creatures. But what about the colonial organism? Thousands of microscopic creatures all working together to achieve one goal. Well, actually, maybe two goals, survival and reproduction. And one of my favorites, and you might not be able to tell by this abstract shot, but this is a sea pen, a sea pen. If you can imagine it standing upright, it's very feathery. And it sort of looks like a quill, one of the old school pens that they used to dip in ink and, I don't know, write a constitution with. This is a colonial organism, meaning what you're seeing is not one thing, but hundreds. And they are all working together. How fascinating is the ocean. We have to keep in mind that it has been around so much longer than the land, and it has allowed these opportunities to take place for these creatures to make their attempts to see which version of themselves would be successful over time. And that is an incredible thing to encounter and to share with you. Now, just diving back in March, I did encounter a new colonial organism, one that I was super excited about, and one that was about the size of a gummy bear. And that's this. Now, your brain is probably asking a lot of questions. Is it candy? No, it's an endarian. Remember, it has stinging cells. It's also very small. Um, can it read your mind? Science doesn't know yet, but we're still figuring these things out. What you're looking at is a hydroid. Now, a hydroid is an adarian. Think of it as sort of somewhere in between a jelly and an anemone. Uh, they stay on the bottom. They stay in one place. They don't move, but they have long arms. Of course, more surface area means more stinging cells. More stinging cells means your chance of catching prey grows exponentially, and thus so will your success as an individual. All very fascinating, all in Alaska. And something that you might not think is in Alaska, but actually is, is coral. That's right. I just said Alaska and coral in the same sentence. Normally you hear coral and your mind goes to some tropical location. And thus it should. That's where coral dominates on our planet, specifically in the equatorial climates or the coral triangle as it is called. But in Alaska, in Alaska, coral comes in 
a variety of different forms. There's the shallow coral, like this orange cup coral, just one individual building a little castle underneath it as it grows, living out its life. And there are deep water corals, several different species. It's not common to run into them when you're diving, but when you do, it is something special to behold. And our last creature in the Nadarian category of this safari is the largest jelly on our planet. And here it is. What you are looking at is something that fishermen fear. Well, fear might be an intense word, but a strong dislike because you're looking at the lion's mane jellyfish. Not the most poisonous on our planet, but poisonous enough to sort of ruin your day. Uh, I have gotten these on my face, in my nose, in my eyes. Welcome to the life of a commercial fisherman and or diver. But when I say that this is the largest jelly on our planet, Back in the early 1900s, one washed up ashore on the East Coast, and it was nine feet across on its bell. Nine feet across. That's incredible. And it also speaks to the productivity of the ocean at that time. The ocean that was, and hopefully will be again. You know, we often talk about blue whales as the biggest creature on our planet, uh, but it's not the longest. Uh, there are jellies who t whose tentacles stretch longer than the entirety of a blue whale. Remember, surface area, more stinging cells, more success. And, you know, I did say that uh, we lost in that podcast competition to Neil deGrasse Tyson, but that's okay because I have my whole underwater universe with all of its stars right here in this photograph. And those are our Nadarians. Let's move on. All right, we learned about these in our trivia. These are the echinoderms. Now get ready, because things are about to get a little weird. We already learned that this creature comes, uh, the name at least, comes from the Greek. It means hedgehog skin or spiny skin, depending on how you translate. So let's, let's figure out what that means, because there's, there's several different species that are included in this echinoderm category. And you know, derm, right? Dermatologist skin, spiny skin. Anytime you run into a Latin word, you can usually suss it out. You just got to break it down. So who's up first in our echinoderm category? Well, here we go again with those colors. All that orange, nice and bright in our face. But keep in mind, this is camouflage. What you're looking at is a cookie cutter sea star. Cookie cutter. That's because of that edge that you're seeing on the bottom right. It goes all around the creature. And it sort of looks like someone took one of those sugar cookie cutters that maybe your grandma has around Christmas and just made a form. Now I chose to lean in and get a nice close up shot of this sea star because I think we underestimate these creatures. I really do. They are complex. We'll see them on a rock in an intertidal zone and sort of shrug. I know what that is, but do you? Do I? Do we really understand how these creatures fill themselves with water in order to move around? And how do they fill themselves with water? Well, do you see that ring uh, sort of in the middle right? And what that is, is called the madre porite. If this is a hydrostatic creature, a hydrostatic skeleton of the creature, then it needs a valve to fill itself with water. And you're looking at it. When I walked the shoreline as a young man, uh, my mother told me that that was the eye of the sea star, which turned out not to be true, but we're going to talk about their eyes in a second. Now, I know you're looking at this, and the first word that probably comes to your mouth, to your mind, maybe your mouth, is cute. Oh, it's cute. And it is. It's a little bit smaller than the size of your hand. I think it's having a rough time because you see uh, some of the limbs are very short. That either means that it's going through growing pain or a predator just nibbled one off. Now, sea, sea stars do have the ability to regenerate. So keep in mind that these creatures can heal themselves. If that's not fascinating enough, what else can we learn about them? Well, we did talk about their eyes. And, you know, 
where are the eyes if you don't have a head? You don't have a brain. Where, where does that information go? Well, we might consider them primitive or simple or, or use sim- synonyms like this. But in truth, uh, these are very complex creatures. That red spot that you're seeing on the end of the arm, also known as the ray, they're called rays on sea stars. So on the end of that ray, you're seeing a red spot, and that red spot is the eye. On the end of each one of the sea star's arms is a red dot, is an eye. Now, is it an eye like ours? Can it, can it read the New York Times? Can it tell when the stoplight changes from red to green? No, it can only tell light from dark. Now, that might seem useless to us and how we live our lives, but if you're a sea star, and it suddenly gets dark, well, you got a problem on your hands because something is over you and it's likely trying to eat you. So if it does suddenly grow dark in sea star land, then they know it's time to hustle shuffle and to start moving as fast as they can away from the thing that's trying to eat them, which might be another sea star because that's just how the ocean works sometimes. Here's another example of one of those eyes, a little less dramatic, uh, but I wanted to show you this creature from a a wider angle before we get in close. This is a leather sea star. It gets that name uh, because of sort of its rough texture. And, you know, here's a weird thing to be known for. You know, you you go online and you punch in a creature's name and you usually get the first like two or three facts about what it is and how fascinating it is. Well, this creature, same, same creatures, leather sea star. When you look it up online, it says, well, when taken out of the water, it smells like garlic. I always find that fascinating to be known for something that you smell like. That's quite strange. There's, there's a lot of other things to talk about here. And again, one of those is hydrostatic inflation. You know, we were talking about how these creatures breathe Well, you're looking at it. And it happens two ways. It happens on the top side which you're seeing here. And then it also happens on the bottom side, which you're seeing here, the morning sun star, upside down, absolutely gorgeous in its blue color, a very rare color in all of nature. In fact, most of the blues that we see, be it in a butterfly's wing or uh, a bird's wing, that's actually a trick of the light. There's no blue pigment in there. It's just how the light is getting absorbed in the patterns in the feathers, Um, absolutely fascinating. Now, sea star feet are there for a reason. You know, uh, they're called podia. Think about tripod, you know, three feet, monopod, one foot. Here are the podia of a sea star. Now they move around with them. They capture prey. They hold on for dear life. And they also breathe through them. It's called diffusion. Now they don't need as much oxygen as we land creatures do. So they just pull it out of the water column through the cell wall. And this happens without any thought. It's just part of their system. And they can extend these arms. They can flip themselves over. They can do all sorts of things. I don't know if we've tested if they can juggle yet, but there's still a lot of years left for science to figure such things out. We are still in the echinoderm category. Now we're going to move on to something even weirder. Now, By all means, let's call this the vacuum cleaner of the ocean. This looks like a vacuum cleaner, at least a part of it. And it is the sea cucumber, or at least one of them. And there are many. Now, this is uh, one of the larger ones that you'll find in Alaska. I've seen them ranging uh, three feet, three and a half. But essentially what they're doing is just crawling along the bottom and eating all the dead organic matter. Things live, things die, things grow, things decay. Something has to happen to all that detritus, that dead organic matter. And these are the creatures that scoop it up. Now, in this version of the sea cucumber, it's it's going out and and, and finding its food. It's on its own safari. Uh, But there are other sea cucumbers who have a different strategy. And that's surface area, patience, and time. What you're looking at here is something that this creature will be doing for the entirety of its life, which is just reaching out and letting those branched appendages 
with this slightly sticky substance on them, grab hold of the food, and one by one, like a child dipping their finger into a peanut butter jar and licking it off, that's how these creatures feed themselves. One arm at a time, one in, one out, while all the others are continuing to collect their food. Now, much like the anemones, they will take their rest, they'll take their relaxation, but this is how these creatures function. Next up in our echinoderm category are the brittle stars. Now, could someone please raise their hand? How many creatures are we looking at here? I, I couldn't believe it when I saw it. Again, when you see this kind of dense mass of life, you have to immediately go to the thought that these are rich waters. These are bioactive, productive waters where there is plenty to eat and plenty of other things that want to eat you. And that is the reason that these brittle stars usually will only stick maybe two to three appendages out at a time. They don't, they don't want their whole body exposed, specifically their mouth where all the you know, business happens. And when they cluster like this, uh, they're, they're safer. And obviously safety in numbers, here's a literal photo of that. And just like other sea stars, they are able to regenerate some of these limbs if a fish came by and took a nibble off of them. And rounding us out in the echinoderm category is one of my favorite creatures. It's actually one of the oldest fossil records of the ocean that we have. I think when I was uh, in the Smithsonian on the East Coast, I saw one as a young man. And what you're looking at is a feather star, also known as crinoid. Now, these are related to the sea stars. You kind of get a feel for that, except this one's a little more abstract. What you're looking at on the bottom there are its feet. It is able to walk, move, hold on to things, but it is called a feather star for a reason. And that's because its appendages, as you see here, very much look like feathers. I mean, the ocean has as many feathers as uh, the sky does uh, for, for us terrestrial creatures, or at least there's some competition there. And the question is, how do these creatures feed themselves? Yes, they're beautiful, they're decorous. Are they functional? Well, let's take a closer look. If you look in between uh, the, the individual portions of the appendage, you're gonna see these little frilly appendages. And what those do is grab hold of food and much like a line of workers passing an item from one to the other, back and forth, that's what they do with their food in this effort of patience that brings it all the way down to their mouth. And their mouth doesn't work like ours. It's just mouth, stomach. There's no esophagus, there's no, no any other business in between. Mouth, stomach. Nature at its simplest, perhaps most beautiful. And speaking of beauty, we're not done with our echinoderms yet because uh, we've been looking at a lot of heavenly things. So maybe maybe let's balance things out and get a little hellish for a second. Uh, what we are looking at is perhaps the definition of a kinoderm, spiny skin. You are looking at a sea urchin. A sea urchin is an echinoderm, relative of all the creatures that we have seen. Now again, this is a creature that we forget because we're like, I know what that is. But do we? Do we understand these minute appendages that are constantly moving? Ask yourself this question. Why is there nothing growing on this creature? The ocean loves to grow things on top of things on top of things. You see it all the time. But you won't see it on an urchin because they're cleaning themselves. And they do so with these little itty bitty appendages. And they inflate those appendages hydrostatically with water. So you're seeing these repeating patterns in the ocean. And this is the top side of a sea urchin. But of course, there's the underside too, which often we don't see because it's on the underside and who's gonna pick up a sea urchin? That sounds like a bad idea. So here, let me save you some hand damage and actually show you what one looks like on the underside. Now, a little bit different, a little bit less spiny because it doesn't need to protect itself here, but you can see its mouth there. And inside that mouth are five teeth. It actually has a great name. This is great for perhaps another trivia question. It's called Aristotle's Lantern. 
because of its symmetry, they sort of kicked it back to the Greeks. And what these creatures do is use those teeth to eat algae, to eat kelp. Uh, but that can be a problem because if there's some imbalance in the ecosystem and there's more urchins than there are predators to eat them, then the kelp can go away pretty fast. Now, urchins are fascinating. They don't like light, so they'll grab hold of things and sort of wear it as a hat. And uh, they do move, they just do so slowly. Maybe you've seen some BBC time-lapse footage where you actually see them scuttling about all across the ocean floor. Those are our echinoderms, and our safari continues next with perhaps a, uh, a crowd favorite, maybe? Yeah, worms. The ocean has them. Uh, anytime you've been sitting on a beach, suntan lotion, book in your hand, there's about a thousand worms underneath you. It's just how the world works. Something to help you sleep at night. And I'm not trying to scare you. I'm trying to fascinate you because this is a worm. What? That, that's not a worm. It can't be. It's too colorful, too blooming like a flower. And what, what's with that trumpet thing there? Well, here we have a calcareous tube worm. They literally build their own shells, their homes, using a, sort of a secretion that they self-create. They pull minerals out of the water and then secrete it. Voila, they have a home. But all of these feathery appendages that you're seeing, you know, they, they are delicate. They are fragile. And they need these to eat. They need them to breathe. So they need to protect them. So that calcareous tube that they build is also a safety parameter for them. But if you have sort of somewhere to hide, you need to close the door, right? If you, if you run inside the castle and you leave the door open, then someone's gonna walk right in. So keep an eye on that trumpet appendage there. It's called the operculum. And when this creature retreats into its tube, that operculum will seal the hatch essentially protecting the creature, that, that operculum, that trumpet-like thing that you can see on the left, sealing the hole, is actually ruddy enough to, to sort of fend off predators, be they shrimp or even a, a fish that's trying to get a little bit of a nibble. These creatures are notoriously hard to photograph because the, the slightest exhale from me, the, the large mammal with the camera in his hand, tends to scare these creatures and they will go in their homes pretty quick. So I'm always happy when I can get a photograph of them. Back in March, I went diving and I found another creature, not new to science, but new to me. And at first I had no concept that it was actually worms. At first I thought it was space aliens come to deliver me a message of peace and love or something. I, I was trying to figure it out and the water was 41 degrees, so I'm not sure that my brain was working at the time, but my fingers were, so I was able to take this photo, and goodness, these creatures are so tiny. They are, they are less than, well, these ones were probably about half an inch to three quarters of an inch, and they were in these large clusters. And again, I've said it so many times, but surface area. Surface area will always do the work for you, especially if you're a filter feeder. So what are they doing? They're throwing that cape open, which is their mouth, and they're allowing the ocean current to bring them their food. Now, thank you for abiding me as we talked about worms. You're probably a little more fascinated than you thought you would be, but that's okay. Now on the safari, we have seen colors. We have seen deadly and dangerous things, deep things, mysterious things, but now, we are going to move on to what I, by all means, consider my favorite category of creature in the ocean. And those are mollusks. Now, not an exciting name, it even sort of gets stuck in your mouth as you're saying it's a mollusk. But in the ocean, these guys are doing a lot of the heavy lifting. They, there's a rich, diverse community of you know, biology in all of its versions. It's fascinating to behold. It also causes a lot of questions and science has been studying these creatures in so many ways and there are still things that we don't know and that's exciting. That's exciting to me. It's exciting to all who are working in research of the ocean right now because 
not only do we want to learn how these creatures are living their lives, but how could we potentially adapt some of these characteristics, maybe in biomimicry and design, or maybe something medical. There's, there's a lot of things to discover. In the mollusk category, generally, they're gonna share some characteristics. They don't have a segmented body. A lot of them have a radula, which is you know, essentially, what did the internet say? A, a minutely toothed chitinous ribbon. That's what a radula is. Think of it like a spiky tongue that licks things, how they devour their food. And actually some limpets in Antarctica with their radula were discovered by science to have the hardest animal created substance on planet earth. It was the radula, the teeth of the radula. For many long years, we thought it was the silk of silkworms was the strongest material, but it actually is the feeding appendage of all these mollusks. Now mollusks come in a lot of shapes and sizes. Like I said, uh, we're gonna look at some of the clams, the bivalves. Now I know this one specifically sort of looks like something out of the imagination of George Lucas. There goes the Millennium Falcon flying out of it. But what you're actually seeing are just the intake and the exhale valve of this clam. One is pulling water in, and in doing so, it gains food and it gains oxygen because clams have gills. Gills are common in the ocean. They're not just reserved for fish. A lot of these mollusks will have them. So in the mollusk category, you, you have you know clams and the like. You also have octopus. That's right. And we're going to talk about them. Not just yet, but I thought this was a good uh, introduction because it has this sort of devilish horn as it was probably asking the same questions about me that I was asking about it. And in the mollusk category, we also have my favorite creature. Now, you probably thought it was an octopus and you're close, uh, but it's not true. It's the nudibranch. Now, we discussed these in the trivia. If you weren't there or if you've long forgotten such knowledge, these are snails, essentially, they're, they're gastropods that have sort of discarded the shell. And some of them do that in the larval stage. Some of them actually internalize it because they have adapted a different strategy. Instead of having a home that's hard that they can escape into and, and hide in, they are announcing themselves. They are saying, I am disgusting and you probably shouldn't eat me. And some fish don't get the message and they try. Uh, I once saw a fish eat a nudibranch, spit it out in disgust, forget that it was disgusting, eat it again, spit it out, forget, eat it again, spit it out. And then finally it got the point and it moved on and the nudibranch rolled its eyes. So these are the three categories of mollusk that I want to discuss with you. So let's get into the things with shells. Here's one of my favorite shells and it should be of yours too. What you're looking at is a young abalone. Now, why do I say young? Well, remember things in the ocean like to grow on top of things. And there's not a lot of growth on this shell just yet. And that's because it's young and that color will darken as it ages and things will start to grow. As you can see here, uh, here's a bit of an older one, a little more mature, a little more decorous. This tends to be the favorite food of sea otters. And I will tell you that in my travels, I have not seen a lot of abalone, uh, even diving around California where they're you know, supposed to be everywhere. But in Sitka Sound, ooh, more abalone than I have ever seen in my life. So very impressive. There's plenty of studies being done uh, by the Sitka Sound Science Center about these creatures. Now, there are other things with shells, but some of those shells have things on top of them. Now, there's a lot going on here. So let's take a moment to explain. First of all, that's a scallop. That's right. That's that thing that you order in a fancy restaurant that is delicious. Except you're only eating one of the mussels that's inside of that creature. And for some reason on the menu, they never tell you how many eyes a scallop has. Now, this probably gives you some sort of an uncomfortable feeling because what's happening? These creatures have eyes just like us, kind of. 
They have corneas. They have a focusing lens in this multitude of eyes, but the eyes are still functionally primitive. They, they really just tell light from dark, like the sea stars that I mentioned earlier. What is growing on this creature? That's a sponge, which acts as protection for this creature because most things in the ocean know that sponges just don't taste good. That's another reason that sponges are one of the oldest creatures in the ocean. Now, if there's any optometrist out there or anyone owns an eyeglass store, then scallops will definitely keep you in business. But just look at the variety of these creatures. This is a swimming scallop, different than the one we saw earlier, able to push water out and escape. Now, it's not going to escape me. I'm a big human. I can swim from A to B. But if there's a predator trying to come at it, and it can swim and only gain about a foot or two removal, a little bit of distance from that creature, it may just survive the day. And I love this close-up specifically because we can see inside of the scallop's mouth. And if you see that ridged line inside of there, this is showing you how the creature feeds, how it filters food out of the water, how it functions, how it lives its life in Alaska, and in other oceans on our planet. But of course, as I think you are all discovering with the variety of this presentation, that Alaska is my favorite place to dive. And I have dove in every ocean on our planet. And I'll tell you what, you can keep the warm water. I like the job security of losing feeling in my fingers as I get to interact with these magnificent creatures. All right, you saw an octopus, you probably want a little bit more. So here we go. Now, first of all, you can never say octopi. Uh, that's adding a Greek plural to a Latin word. So that's a big no-no. It's octopuses. There, you learned something. Also, apparently octopus like to wear sea urchins as a hat sometimes. I don't know. That doesn't look comfortable to me, uh, but the creature seemed fine with it. Now, octopus are very smart. Uh, they know three-card money. I'm just kidding. Anybody knows that game, and I'm referring to those barnacles to the left there. But they are intelligent. And how do we measure such things? Well, they just won an Oscar. Hey-o, uh, that was the octopus teacher, bad joke, but we have four lobes in our brain, four. Octopus, 72, 72 lobes in their brain. Well, something's going on there. And that brain actually wraps around their throat. So they have to be very, careful and very sure that when they eat something, when they consume something, that it better be dead. And usually it is. Why? Because octopus have a beak, it can crunch, but they also have poison. Every octopus on our planet has a little bit of poison. Now, some of them have a whole lot, like the blue ring octopus, but luckily the giant Pacific octopus is large enough that it usually doesn't have to worry about the poison part. It can rip, it can tear, it can bite, it can do all the things. And if you remember that wingspan from our trivia, that is over 15 feet. And I will tell you, I have, I have encountered those creatures before. And one time I encountered a mother who was guarding some eggs and she got very upset with me. And I, will, I swam very fast in the other direction. Let's just keep it that, at that. But what you're seeing here is something incredible because our human eyes don't pick up this kind of detail. But when you add light, when you add the technology of my Olympus camera with its 60 millimeter macro lens, all of a sudden you're starting to see veins. You start to, starting to see interconnectedness, stretching, flexing. Remember that these creatures can not only change the color of their skin, but the texture as well. And I'm sure you all know that they can hydrostatically deflate themselves, remove nearly all the water from their body, and anything that their beak can fit through, so can they. As simple as that. Now, I like to call this next photo 2021. No, I, I don't know. Just playing on how time is a spiral during this pandemic, but goodness. What is this creature doing? Why did it come out of its hole to greet me? Why did it spend 25 minutes inspecting me, touching me, 
trying to figure out what I was. Why wasn't it afraid by the bubble blowing mammal with its large camera and large loud flash? I don't know. And that's okay because I got to walk away from that feeling pretty special. I actually found two octopus in the same day. Um, my dry suit was leaking. I was shivering. I didn't care because these interactions are sometimes once in a lifetime. Luckily, this is what I do for a living. So I run into these creatures all the time, but each one of those suckers has 25,000 chemical receptors. Every sucker, 25K chemical receptors. What does that mean? That means if they touch our skin, then they can learn about us. They know if we have a disease like cancer, uh, it's been found out that octopus can tell whether or not a female is pregnant or not. They can recognize faces. But here's the crazy thing, is they only have one photoreceptor in their eyes. And for anyone who knows, that means that they see in grayscale, which means that they're colorblind, or at least that's what scientists have theorized. But how is that possible for a creature that changes its color so much instantaneously to blend in with its environment? We don't know exactly, but we do know about this protein called opsin, O-P-S-I-N. I believe that's how it's spelled. And opsin is a protein that is only found in one place in other creatures. And that's inside of its eye. So if that protein which is in the eye of other creatures, is in the skin of octopus, it begs the question, do octopus see with their skin? If anything fascinates you about tonight besides the texture and the color and the bad jokes, let that sink in for a second. And now to finish our grand great Alaskan invertebrate safari, we're gonna talk about the nudibranchs because these are the reason I go to Alaska, because there's so many of them. Worldwide, we're talking about 3,000 different species. One of these days, I'll go looking for the warm water one. But in the meantime, let us enjoy the bounty of what Alaska offers. Here is the noble sea lemon. I don't know who gets to name these things, but good job. And nudibranchs have one thing, in, uh, many things in common, but here's one of the most noticeable by the human eye. And that's these sort of horns. They're, they're called rhinophores. And these are chemical receptors. This is how they taste the water around them. This is how they find food. This is how they find mates. Remember surface area. The more of it, the more you are able to take in information or gather prey. Now, again, all shapes, sizes, and colors, and a function that is almost beyond uh, our comprehension, or at least our imagination. These are fascinating creatures that have adapted in a myriad of ways. And all of these are, are only photographed within a few spare miles, maybe a 20 mile radius. And that's just how it goes in Alaska. Often when I go on an hour long dive, I'm not moving a lot because there's just that much life. And I could spend a half an hour talking to you about each one of these creatures why they are, what they are, and how they interact with their environment. Some of them eat each other. That happens in nature all the time. But none of them have that external shell, but they're all using their own subtle variety. It might be the frosting uh, of this one, or it might just be the size of this giant nudibranch. That's not an adjective, that's its actual name. And this thing surprised me more than I can say just because of how strange it is. Every, every one of those appendages was just flapping back and forth in the ocean current, uh, very willy-nilly, which speaks to its fluidity and its dynamic existence. Found this one at about 40 feet uh, just off the shoreline in Sitka, Alaska. As you're seeing, some of them choose to go all white. Other them, others, like this clown nudibranch, take a more decorous uh, viewpoint, but all of them are equally fascinating, full of splendor, and like you learned in the trivia, they do eat foul-tasting things, but instead of just, just digesting them, 
they reincorporate them into their body and use that poison or that foul taste to become their own defense. They absorb the defense of their prey and make it their own. That is one of the most fascinating things I've ever encountered in the ocean. And, you know, beyond the beauty, we have to dig into the function of these creatures. I mean, yes, they're just like us. Yes, they, they have traffic jams because there's rush hour and scuttling about. Uh, but you get a sense that do they even know how beautiful they are or even what beauty is? Every thought that you've had during this presentation has been a human thought. And all of these creatures live entirely different than we do. They, they live fascinatingly. They live complex lives. This one balanced upon the eelgrass. But I'll tell you, when COVID struck, and I realized that I wasn't going to Antarctica and that many other dive opportunities were taken from me, I decided to dedicate my time, my resources to go up to Alaska. And when I did, there was one species that I really wanted to find. And I did find it. And it is with this species that I will end our presentation showing you a couple of this mysterious wonder. Is it a mollusk? Yes. Is it a nudibranch? Yes. Severely different than all of the creatures we've seen up until now. Many of you probably said uh, it's a cross between a jellyfish and a Venus flytrap. And actually you're not completely wrong. Uh, what these creatures are doing with these large oral hoods is just waiting for the ocean current to bring them some food. Open, gather, close, consume, repeat. This is what these creatures do for their entire lives. They do so with beauty and with grace and largely outside of the view of humanity. You know, I, I get to share this with you and maybe introduce some of these species to you, but they're still in the water. They're still living their lives. They're still interacting. Uh, maybe they have a communication that we don't know. Maybe they have something that we might even call an emotion. Certainly fear is the natural response because it makes us run away. So why wouldn't an animal have some version of that? But when we encounter all of these invertebrates, we get a sense for what the ocean actually is, which informs how we live. Because you can, you can take all this and tomorrow you can say to someone, man, I saw some cool stuff stuff I've never seen before, some colors that I didn't expect, or you can contextualize it, sort of let it sink in and be like, wait, I just learned a whole lot about my planet through this aesthetic lens. Because let's be honest, the photos are beautiful, but the story behind them is what matters the most to me. I want you to rem remember not just the beauty and the color, but that these creatures have a function. Some of them is to be translucent and to have eelgrass stuck inside your head or like this guy, but whatever it is, it is the ocean. And it's been around longer than we have and it'll be here when we're gone. And it is worth our time, our attention and our respect. So with that, I will say thank you to Omzi. Uh, I've done several of these from all portions of our planet and I'm always excited uh, to join back up with this wonderful organization. And thank you for listening. Thank you for joining on this safari. And now uh, we'll get into some questions and I hope you have some. Thank you. Wow. Uh, thank you, Paul North, for all of those great photos and really interesting stories behind these creatures. Um, I uh, I know I have questions and uh, so do our guests. And just a reminder to folks out there for, um, if, if you wanna submit a question, if you have uh, some questions, just put them in the comments, uh, whatever, whatever platform you're on, add them to the comments there and um, we'll add them to our list and we'll get some questions going. 
So um, first, I just want to uh, have a couple questions that I, and I'm not sure which one I want to ask first. But my <laughs> first one, I think, is just a practical thing of when you're diving in Alaska, how long can you dive for bec before the cold just becomes too unbearable? Or is it, are you equipped enough where it's really just the amount of oxygen you have in your tank? Great question. Uh, it, it all is circumstantially dependent. When I was a commercial diver, I was using a hookah system, which is not a tank, but rather an engine up on the boat with a hose that is feeding the air. And I spent four hours and 15 minutes underwater. And I didn't really recognize myself when I came up. Uh, so that's sort of the limit for me. But I would say generally a dive, if you manage your air properly, you can stay down for an hour. Oh wow, that that's that's incredible. That I I wouldn't I wouldn't think that. <laughs> I would I would think like uh, twenty minutes and it might be might be difficult. So a four hour dive sounds incredible. Um, wow. Um, another question is um, throughout your photography, I was stunned by the amount and variety of vibrant colors in in the invertebrates. <laughs> And is that true of many of the in invertebrates in the oceans around Alaska? Is it uh, something about the oceans in general that I just don't know about? And, and why so colorful? You know, I would, I would equate it, well, let's just broad scale, color in the ocean is communication. You're there saying, hey, I'd like to talk to you or stay away, you know, essentially boiling it down. But Water clarity becomes a factor because if you're in the tropics and you're bright and shiny, a lot more of that sunshine is going to hit you. So you're going to be more visible. But when you're in the murk, and keep in mind that even right now, Alaska's plankton bloom, its algae is, is really kicking up now that it's getting all that spring sunshine. And that's going to cloud the water up. And many of these creatures, octopus included, you know, an octopus has wide angle vision and they can only see for about eight feet or so. Hmm. Now they have much more complex eyes and can uh, detect prey because they're complex creatures, but most creatures will just swim over something if it looks like the rock that it's sitting on. And you know, evolution is taking things in that direction to help these creatures be cryptic and, and camouflaged. Excellent, yeah, nice. Uh, thank, you. thank you for answering those. So uh, a question from um, one of our attendees here. Sea star wasting disease. Do you see that in, in Alaska? 100%. Uh, if you remember that goofy photo of the sea star crawling up my chest, uh, that is the species that is most affected by wasting disease. And for those who don't know, wasting disease is afflicting uh, many sea stars on the West Coast from California all the way up to Alaska. And it essentially, it's, it's like they are deteriorating from the inside out. And it, it's quite hard to witness. And it does have to do with a variety of factors. One of those is warming water and any, any temperature difference allows new organisms, even microscopic viruses and bacteria into the water and that is having some changes on the ecosystem, most devastatingly with the, the wasting sea star disease. And one, one of the best metrics for me is uh, I'm often driving zodiacs, bringing people to and from shore. And when I look down in the shallows where I can see the bottom, I used to see half a dozen, if not more of those sea stars as I would go from land uh, to the vessel and back. And now, even on a dive, uh, they are hard to come by. You know, everything that you've seen in this presentation was five weeks of diving. And uh, I, I do plan to, to release a book on the area using some of these photos. But in that time, five weeks of diving, I think I only came across about five of those creatures. So their numbers are, are plummeting and it, it, is, it is very disturbing. Wow. Yeah, that, that does sound very disturbing. Is, is the, do we know much about the status of the disease? Like as far as 
the spread of it or any adaptations to it? Or are we just, are we still kind of learning about it? Cause it's, I mean, to me, it's relatively new. So I don't know if it's relatively new to science as well. Uh, no, there was a case, uh, um, these are broad strokes, but I'm pretty sure there was a, a case of it back in the seventies that came and went. Uh, so it, it's not like it, it, it will be here to stay, you know, things have their cycle. The question is how, well will these creatures fare in the meantime while, while it is present. So uh, I must admit, given that I, I haven't been functioning as a naturalist for a year and a half, I haven't checked in on the latest, but anyone who wants to know, there is a huge amount of information on this topic, lots of scientists doing research on it, and certainly worth your attention. Nice. Uh, thanks so much on that. Um, and, and I would imagine that multiple stressors you know, can compound um, something like sea star wasting disease. So the next question is, a, is another type of stressor is um, thinking about climate change and um, how has climate change impacted or has it impacted some of the marine animals that you showed in the safari? Thank you for mentioning the safari. Uh, Sitka, Alaska is a fascinating place and the science center there even more so because, you know, just think of it from a geological perspective or sorry, geographic perspective. Sitka's right at that line where that warm Southern water is, is still coming North, whereas the colder water from the North is, is merging with it. So it's this confluence. So the science center is actually actively doing experimentation on kelp species in order to figure out uh, exactly what might happen to the species. They're trying to forecast and predict how the kelp will fare in different scenarios of acidity change and various other parameters like that. Um, there's a scientist, Lauren Bell, uh, who works with the Science Center. You should definitely check out her work. Uh, if you go to their website, you can find out more about that. But yes, uh, climate change is, is visible in, in many, many places. Uh, one of those could theoretically be why a lot of the humpback whales are sticking around for longer. Uh, might be a little bit warmer there. Some of the food might stick around longer. So they see an opportunity and remain instead of heading south. Uh, there are, there's some bad stuff going on with sea lions with uh, a certain uh, acid that they're getting from uh, basically bioaccumulation from the food that they're eating. And it's a, it has neurotoxins in it, and it's sort of making them having have seizures underwater. You know, we can go down the dark road and, and, and talk about uh, these various changes, the ones we know about and theorize about the ones we don't. But push comes to shove, the, the greater conversation here is that there are a lot of us uh, on, on this planet. So I think from a human ego standpoint, we like to sort of kick the bucket down the road and say, well, would the earth is too big for us to affect it in this way. You know, you, you hear those arguments, but really I think it just boils down to math. There's a lot of us and each one of us is producing X amount of waste. And most all of that is going in the ocean in some way or another. And, and there are battles ahead, uh, but this is the reason why OMSI does what it does, why Meet the Ocean is active. You know, what we're trying to do is, is inform and inspire the next generation because, you know, we, we've heard that so many times it almost has lost its meaning, but that's where the real fight is happening is convincing the youth that their planet is worth defending. Completely. Yeah. Completely agreed. Well said for sure. Um, speaking of which, since, uh, you know, we're talking about maybe solutions, are there, Water areas protected. Uh, one of the questions here is, are there water areas protected in Alaska to preserve the ecosystems there? Absolutely. Um, the last species that you saw, the hooded nudibranchs, those very ethereal, ghostly looking creatures, those were photographed within a state park, a Magoon Island State Park. So no fishing happens there of any kind. And of course, because of that, all the biology on the bottom has a big smile on its face. <laughs> yeah, I imagine. Um, 
And and also uh, there's another question here against I guess speaking in the in the similar of um, solutions. Is there anything specific you personally do to protect our oceans, or do you have recommendations for for us about ways we can be we can be better stewards of the ocean, even if you know some of us don't live very near the ocean? Um, what should we think about whether we live right next to it or farther away from it? about being a better steward of the ocean. Yeah, I, you know, I, I run a nonprofit that gives these kind of talks all year long. And, and that is always a question uh, that we get asked. And it's an important one because everyone listening, obviously, well, hopefully you, you learned a little bit about Alaska, you care a little bit about it. And, you know, keep in mind, no matter how far you live from the ocean, you're still dependent on it. And I don't mean for shrimp cocktails, but rather the air that you breathe. You know, over 50% of oxygen from photosynthesis comes from marine algae. So if you're in Kansas, you can't throw away the ocean. You still need it. And, you know, how, how do we take the personal responsibility to affect some sort of change? Well, staying informed is very important. You know, mo most of us sort of treat the ocean as like a hobby. Uh, but really, I think it boils down to those you empower, and by that I mean those you vote for, and also personal choices, personal purchase choices. You know, what in your life is just a little bit too unnecessary to sort of justify the plastic or the, the waste of any kind? And I'm not, I don't like going down the road to, to minimize and have the people who care about the planet sort of keeping track of each other to make sure we're, we're all nitpicky and being that sort of minutia oversight steward kind of situation. The, the truth is, is just, just do the best you can because really, and, and I'll say this quite frankly, I get upset that these decisions fall on us, the individuals, the purchasers. Why can't it be on the other end for those who are making the product? When, when you suddenly discover that, oh my goodness, this shampoo has plastic in it. My Goodness. And then you hear that the company is going to phase that out in six years. Well, that's not acceptable to me because that has no urgency to it. And if we're really fighting for our planet, a little more urgency and a little less protecting of the bottom line and the free market economy, I think might be in order because if we don't have a planet, then we don't have a free market economy. So there are, there are just some things we need to prioritize. I don't know if I overcomplicated that answer or not. No, uh, uh, Paul, I think, I think that's great. Exactly. You know, thinking about the priorities that we collectively have and, and what we really, the decisions we want to make behind it is, um, is excellent. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Um, our next question from our watchers is, um, and I'm not sure what this re refers to. So maybe you do. Um, what about urchin barons? Is that something, urchin barons? Yes, can you speak about that? Yeah, it sure is. So an urchin baron is, you know, I mentioned balance. So urchins eat algae. That's why they have those sharp teeth and those teeth are always growing. So they need to keep them working to, to wear them down. Um, a couple of species in nature that sort of have that situation going on, but urchins are hungry. They're gonna eat, they're gonna reproduce their babies are gonna eat. You need a predator in the ecosystem to mitigate that. And often in Alaska, that's a sea, urchin, uh, sorry, a sea otter. Sea otters eat about 35% of their body weight every day. Just do some quick math on yourself and imagine how many hamburgers and cheesecake that would take for you to fulfill 35% of your body weight every day. And the reason they eat that much is, is they don't have that layer of fat that say uh, a seal would to keep themselves warm. They, they just have fur, so they're just burning a lot of calories. And in doing so, they're eating a lot of urchins. But if that predator is removed, you get something that's been described as a trophic cascade. That basically means if you take the big predator down, then that's gonna affect the rest of the ecosystem. It's gonna kind of trickle down. I will say, there was a big difference in life between my fall dives and my late winter dives. I saw a lot more 
uh, urchin barren, but I also saw a lot less biodiversity. I equate that to the temperature of the water. I think some things just went a little bit deeper to get warm, but urchin barrens exist. Uh, in California, they're a real problem. Uh, in Alaska, they, they are a problem here and there, not, not as drastically as down in California or other areas. But, you know, I started the lecture, I'm sorry, I started the safari by talking about kelp, talking about it being a home and a habitat uh, and also a food source. So if urchins are removing that, and the unfortunate thing is, you know, if you have a, a hundred foot piece of kelp, the urchin's only gonna eat the bottom of it and the rest is gonna float away. So there goes somebody's home, there goes somebody's dinner, and that is a waste of resources. Something somewhere else will digest it or you know, nature will process it, but locally, it's gonna harm the ecosystem if it happens in mass, which is what causes these urchin barrens. Wow, wow, that's a, a really great example of connections in the systems and the impacts on others. Um, yeah, thanks. Um, it looks like maybe there's just a couple more questions left, Paul. And uh, this next question is um, referring back to your safari. You mentioned uh, hooded nudibranch is your favorite. Do you have a least favorite invertebrate? <laughs> um, I'm trying to think of like what I've been stung by or stepped <laughs> on. Uh, um, let's see. Uh, I've never been asked that question. Goodness. Um, I, I, I don't think I can say that I do because if it's ugly, it still has purpose. Someone out there loves it. will mate with it or eat it. You know, like these saying favorites is, is difficult because I always boil things down to function. Like, hey, you're ugly, but you have a purpose, so you're good with me. Um, maybe I can get away with saying the phrase, I haven't met an invertebrate I didn't like, but if I do find one, I'll let you know. <laughs> that sounds good. That sounds good. Uh, I, I like that, and um, I think we'll leave it at that. I think that that answers all the questions here. Um, thank you so much, Paul, for your time um, and the, the sharing the photography and the stories and the knowledge and, and the passion that you have and the mission behind Meet the Ocean. Um, I know I learned a lot. I know a lot of our guests, or I'm, I'm sure a lot of our guests learned a lot as well and, and um, are going to leave inspi um, inspired. So, um, well, thank you. yeah, thanks for, thanks for joining. Um, well, um, everyone else out there, we are out of time. Um, I hope you all enjoyed the event like I did. I, um, if you would like to watch the video again or share it with your friends, maybe they couldn't make it, um, they can go back and check out the video sections on OMSI's Facebook or on our YouTube channel, and they can um, see the video there. Uh, don't forget to follow us on social media so you can have more updates on different events or other kind of inspiring content. And also, I know I mentioned at the beginning, but consider supporting Science Pub and making a donation. So if you want to see our next Science Pub, two weeks on June 1st, there's a lecture by Dr. Greg Redelec from the University of Oregon. And he's going to tell us about, about the two dinosaur fossils discovered in Oregon. Two dinosaur fossils. Why just two? Um, so once again, Thank you to our partner, Celestream, for making tonight's event possible. We really appreciate it. And then everyone, you can always get more information by going to our website, omz.edu. Thanks all. Have a good night. Thanks again, Paul. You're welcome.